Hello, everybody, and welcome to Want to Improve Cybersecurity War Game. This is a presentation that's going to be delivered by myself, uh, Jerry Murphy, and Don Vandegriff. And Jerry is going to go ahead and introduce everybody. Jerry, oh, take it away. Well, you just heard from John Till Johnson, who is the CEO and founder of Numerities. It's an IT advisory company that's been around for over 20 years now. Uh, she's accompanied by Donald Vandergrip, who's the a director of adaptive leadership training, who has decades of experience in military forces, both the Army uh, and the Air Force and the Marine Corps, uh, helping them with uh, training the leaders of tomorrow. And my name is Jerry Murphy. I'm the Senior Vice President of Research and Consulting in the Mirides, and I myself, uh, West Point grad, have a uh, Decade plus experience in military, plus uh, decades uh, helping IT uh, leaders build the uh, next generation data centers. So that's really us coming together to share our wisdom and best practices on wargaming. Just one comment before we jump forward. Uh, Don now has a goatee, and I really love it. I, I think it looks great, Don. Thank um, you. Well, so. what, what are we here about? Wargaming. Do not be deceived by the term which comes from the German uh, translation of Kriegspiel, uh, but wargaming is actually an interactive way to make decisions. So if any of you out there are, are linking this to Germans, it's really linked to the Prussians prior hand. And it's a great way to build team, build decision making, and simulation of a pain-free, i.e. you can make mistakes, and what's good about it is at Nemertes, we've applied it to all types of organizations, regardless of what they're designed for. We've done IT, we've done police, we've done military. So we have adopted this approach to the adaptive leader test uh, training to fit any organization. And once we get with you, we design a war game that will test your ability to overcome problems and will also bond your team and make it more cohesive. And with that, I'll pass you off. Okay, thanks, Don. And just to just to draw the connections, wargaming can be applied across the board. It's a great way to learn, and nobody dies. Um, in this specific presentation, we'll be talking about cyber wargaming. And with cyber wargaming, that's a subset of wargaming generally that's designed to stress test, as you might imagine, all the pieces of your cyber organization. So what are some of the what are the, the key characteristics that you need in place to make a cyber war game effective? The first one is it has to be realistic and up to date. So you have to be testing against threats that are actually happening in the here and now. That's incredibly important. Um, second piece is that you really want a limited viewpoint. So the participants in the game need to get the information the same way you would if you were responding to a security incident in the real world. You don't know what's going on, and your challenge is, under intense time pressure, how to figure out what is going on and make appropriate decisions, as Don said. So you need that limited viewpoint. It also has to be comprehensive. As Don mentioned, this tests all aspects of the organization, its people, its technology, its processes, and its policies, because the, pol the processes are simply the instantiation of the policies, and may any one of these can have gaps or limitations. It also should be unpredictable. If you know exactly what's going to happen next, that's not a good simulation of the real world in a cyber attack. It should be pro progressive, meaning that both in any one war game and in the series of war games, you should be moving from scenario to scenario, stressing different things and improving your baseline. And last but not least, it should be interactive. So, Jerry, you want to tell us what it means to be realistic and up-to-date? Well, well, the first thing I was going to do is, as I say, I was going to show it was unpredictable because I threw a pen at you, but that doesn't really translate well on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> was supposed to I be didn't see it. Sorry. Oh, well, yeah. So, that's unpredictable for me. Anyhow, uh, we recently did a test, and just to show when we were doing a cyber warfare training with um, uh, one of our clients, uh, we actually... Uh, used uh, the funny thing is there's a bunch of different viruses and attacks that are out there. We actually picked one called Not Petya, which was big kind of in like the 2011s, but then you hadn't really heard anything about it. But I was like, I really think that this is one because it came out of sort of Ukraine and Russia, and with the whole Ukrainian war started, I suspected that this is something that may come up again. So we actually used some real 
um, alerts, real systems that were compromised, ways that they do um, lateral expansion, uh, stealing of data, collecting money, and so on. And we put that in the exercise. Sure enough, I think either the day before or a couple days after we did this exercise, you come to find out that absolutely uh, Russia is using the NotPetya attack to exacerbate communication systems uh, in the Ukrainian war. So it's important that because if it doesn't have currency, it's it's either going to be a not relevant or b, you know, not grab people's attentions the way real world uh, things happen. So uh, have some of the details here that you can read, but it's important to understand that the more you can make things based on real life, uh, the more relevant and the more you're going to get people's attentions to really concentrate on what's going on. And I'll pass the deep point. What this is important about is you are not given all the information. You have to make assumptions and, and use facts from the scenario. You have to work either as a team or an individual. And we start off the war game with a real world situation. And then you've got to start making decisions within a time factor. Everyone always goes, why time limitation? because it forces you to use your gut and make a decision. It also opens up discussions later on that we'll talk about that enable the people to learn from one another. And I think, Don, one of the other things you had pointed out here is that the limited viewpoint accurately simulates the literal fog of war that happens both in, re in real war and in cyber warfare. Yes, exactly. And I was Very just going to there, oh, sorry. And I was just gonna throw out there, uh, in timing, right, and the reality is when you have an actual incident, you have fixed time frames. Somebody's going to have a ransom. They're going to say, if you don't give me the money in so much time, I'm wiping out your data. So, And, and more realistically, that, you know, that virus can be propagating very, very quickly in seconds or minutes. So you're going to have to be making decisions in seconds or minutes. You, you don't have the luxury of sitting down and having 36 hours to debate it. Right. Yeah. Um, well, and... Moving on to unpredictable, aside from getting pens thrown at me, uh, the whole the whole unpredictability here really comes from examples of the perfect storm, because that's actually what happens. So what if the attack vector happens to be the facilities IoT network and it brings the data center down or as what happened with Facebook locks everyone out of the facilities? So you can say, oh, well, our incident response plan says we go into the facilities and reboot everything manually a little hard to do if you've been locked out of the facilities. Or what if a SIP man in the middle attack compromises sensitive voice calls, so suddenly you're counting on being able to call your colleagues and you can't because the phones don't work. Yeah. Or what if a key person is out with the flu? This Our clients always do this. They say, okay, so what happens next is we call Sue. And, and I'm like, what if Sue isn't there? Well, she can't not be there. Well, I don't know, does Sue ever take vacation? Does she ever get sick? I mean, so basically when you're architecting one of these games, you want to make sure that that the unpredictable things happen. And, you know, you want to really explicitly stress test the implicit assumptions of your incident response plan, the IRP. Things like that there is a contact list that you can find it. The particular individuals are reachable and the, that you know, key decisions can be made, the facilities can be entered. All these things are implicit assumptions that you really wanna design your test to stress test. I have more than one way I can get in touch with somebody. Uh, that's another one. People just assume I can use a phone. Well, phone systems are down. Oh, I'm gonna use my email. Office 365 is down. So yeah. uh, it's interesting you find these things. So, uh, so not only should it be unpredictable, uh, but a natural extent of that is it should be comprehensive. You don't want to simply test one aspect. You really want to test your people. You know, do the people understand? Do they know who, who each other there is to talk to each other? Because very often in these scenarios where you have an exception, you may have to talk to somebody you don't normally talk to, like the FBI or uh, somebody in finance. You're in IT, but now all of a sudden I got to talk to somebody in finance about What's our what's our insurance policy say on this? So, so uh, there are people I don't necessarily talk to all the time. So who are those people? What are the processes that I do? Uh, sometimes even the policies. We, we may be questioning, you know, what is my policy, for example, of 
do we pay ransoms or do we not pay ransoms? Uh, they, they may have passed a law saying it's illegal for you to pay money to uh, a nation state. That's just not. Which it's, they actually did and it is. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so you want to look at your people, you want to look at your process, your policies and the tools and technology. So often people are really focused on the tool. Do I have an antivirus tool? Have I isolated my network? But it's really, if you're going to be effective in exercising your war game plans, you really need to look at all of those things holistically. And the next thing is uh, <clears throat> make it progressive. So uh, as I heard Jonna describing all of these things you need to consider, it can be very easy for somebody to get overwhelmed with all that stuff. The good news is you don't have to start with everything. Very often when we do these exercises, you start with a very simple exercise um, and you just create one variable. And as people get used to that one variable, then you add another variable. Um, and so as people get more and more comfortable and more and more confident, then you can take away those training wheels and say, okay, you're used to communicating, you know who to talk to. Now we take away your phone system. What do you do now? Oh, crap. So now you think about that. Now I've got used to the phone system. Okay, now let's take away your email system. Now your data center, the power's out in your data center. So you add more and more sophistication. I, I think about when I was in the military, we did these training systems where we had a computer. We started with, you know, my tank is stationary and the enemy tank is stationary. Then I'm stationary, they're moving. Now he's moving, I'm moving. Now we're both moving and it's raining. Now there's fog. Now I'm wearing my chemical protective mask and it's at night and my engine stalled out. So that's the whole concept is you build your skills. You don't do these trainings once a year. You do them ideally repeatedly. I learn from my previous one. I gain confidence. I gain skill. I gain used to talking with it and trusting the people I'm working with. I trust my systems. I trust my process, processes, modify them as I need to. And then hopefully, uh, and, and if you notice, this arrow goes up to infinity, right? We're never done. We're never done because the scenarios are always going to change. Our people are going to change. Our processes are going to change. We need to continuously evolve with them if we're going to get better over time. Interactive. What's really great about this learning methodology, which again, uh, we have studied over the last 30 years, how learning is best done. And I learned a lot from a mentor and friend, Dr. Robert Bork, who is the head of uh, a school of psychology at UCLA. One of the best lecturers I've ever heard. If he does a lecture, he usually puts you through problem solving games, but he says the way we learn is backwards from the way we do it. So what we allow you to do is this interactive immersion problem solving, and we get you where everyone participates. We learn from each other. One of the biggest things we find out is, wow, Jonna had a great idea, but she never says anything. And I just learned more about her as a teammate. Or Jerry, uh, wow, Jerry, that was a good point that I didn't think of. And the team begins to bond. And that's one of the good benefits from this. Uh, like I said, we design our war games off of learning methodology of what's called adaptive leader training but we can do it where it's shaped toward cybersecurity teams, IT management leadership. Uh, but the good thing is our facilitators within the game, we make sure everyone has to participate and play. And, and, and Don, before we jump to the next yeah. slide, I'm going to say something that sounds very trivial, but it's actually profound because oh, the way I think of this is play pretend for grownups. We don't use fancy tools. Your imagination is the fanciest tool, but the reason it works is because it's the most it, it's the most intimate way to understand something is to imagine it. You know, even if you're looking at a TV screen, the best Hollywood production, really all it's trying to do is get fire off those neurons so that you're imagining this being in that situation. And if you can do that with your team, that's the most powerful learning experience. We, we did an exercise a year ago at Fort Hood with the senior leaders of the Garrison Command. They were all military, but they weren't doing mil They were managing a large city. And they all said, we did not realize 
what we didn't know about each other and we learned more. And we found out later they went and used the methodology to develop problem solving games to solve their own problems. And a lot of times what you find, and I find this all the time, is you don't know what you don't know. And when you when you sh- tap in other people's experience, you're, you're sitting there as a leader thinking, man, here's an issue I'm coming up with, and I don't know how to get access to this information. Only to find out when you're junior people, like, I have that information in the system over here. It's been sitting here, not used for two years. Oh, crap. I didn't, you, know, you didn't even know it was there. And this person... That that is do it's part of their job, but since you're not doing their job, you didn't realize there was this data that you've been struggling to find. You just never thought to ask this person that you you didn't know that this person had this information. Exactly. Very you, good. Well, you never asked me if I had that information. <laughs> Happens all exactly. the time. So the after action review, which is the centerpiece of the alt approach. Being a centerpiece, it's not like most people assume, well, tell me what you did wrong and what you did right. No, our facilitators take you through how you did through the gaming process with a focus on two or three main points. And we get you to tell us what you did good or what you can improve on. Not bad, because again, we are about improving and evolving you. So that's important. We're not there to stand on a podium and say, I'm the smartest a lady or guy in the room, and I'm going to prove it to you, which happens a lot everywhere. No, we're there to show you we're learning as much from you as you are from us, but more so you're learning from each other. So what you want to do is every time you do a scenario or game, you want to do an AAR. You, what you don't want to do is do a series of events and then finally do an AAR because you have to. Because, again, it's all about evolution and learning from each step uh, Jerry put it well about we grow in complexity with the problems as we go along as you gain confidence. We want you to gain confidence, not destroy your confidence, as like Jerry and I suffered through some Army schools where they try to destroy it right from the get-go. Uh, so we find out, again, we go back to the team-building aspect of the AAR. And what everyone find, says in the AAR or when we do an AAR, the actual – all session, which is about how did we do, everyone says, as they said, I did not realize so-and-so on our team knew what they knew because they're quiet or they don't. We even, when we do team exercises, we take the junior person in your group and make them the group leader. So you're not dominated by one type of voice and you start learning about each other. It exposes your team to different views. You find out things, as John has said earlier, about each other that you may not have known. We get that a lot in the AARs. We appre- you guys bonded our team even more, uh, which is exposing the dip. When we talk about diversity of thought, that's very important. Okay, different points of view. That's what we're trying to do. Great teams bring that to the table, and they're not shut down. Changes to recommend. The other thing we find out is everyone that does this approach. A lot of them will follow me after we've done with a session and said, now I need to know, I ne- now I know what I have to do to make my processes systems better. And then I need to test them out in another war game. And then you began gathering that information for your next level from these AARs. It's my favorite session uh, because again, the reason it's my not because we're we're at the end, is there's always something new and exciting that comes out. From, from our students, I call them students, our clients or the, the audience that says, hey, this is what we learned from this. And it's wonderful to get that. And I've never had one where, I've not had one uh, where, oh, I didn't learn anything from this. It's just the opposite. Can we, before we knew it, it was over with and we want some more. And I just want to weigh in on this, that from the specific perspective of cyber war gaming, you know, one of the things that happens, as Don mentioned, you're doing it throughout after each scenario. So it's not go through the game and then sit down and create a spreadsheet. Oh, we've got to harden over here. We've got to fix over there. We've got to modify our, our, our RRP over here. No, through each scenario, you're actually capturing things each time you go through. You still end up with that checklist on the spreadsheet, but you also end, end, end up with a much deeper understanding of how your organization operates. And you know, I know you probably didn't 
come prepared to to hear about team building as part of the cyber war gaming, but it is a key piece, as Don said. So the real question the of it is just real quickly. It's like yeah. we do these sessions; they they'll last for four to six hours, and I swear every time I do one, it feels like it took fifteen minutes, and we yep. didn't have enough time. And the and the clients say that as well. Um, and speaking of time, uh, Jerry mentioned this earlier. How often should you cyber war game? I will tell you, most of our clients do it annually under duress because somebody said they had to. Um, well, that's better than not doing it. So that's why we're saying it's good. Better would be quarterly uh, on your own initiative and the best. And when I say the best, I'm looking at the top, the top cybersecurity organizations out there are wargaming continually. They never stop. It's built into their sec ops. They're doing it. And that actually averages out to anywhere from six to eight times a year. That's a lot of wargaming. And you may be thinking, gee, that's overhead, John, and we don't have time for that. No, it's essential because it's how you're prepping to handle the events that will come your way. So how, how do you fit all that into your day job? Do you recognize that you can pipeline two pieces of this. So the preparation is reviewing current attacks, staying up to date with MITRE attack uh, and other sources for newly discussed discovered threats, reviewing your IRP, looking at what you've got. This should be an ongoing process and too often it isn't. So you can be doing that. That can take one to three weeks, depending on how large you are. Then you conduct the exercise, which is actually only a day or two. It's really not, it's very intense, as Jerry said, but it's not that long. And then the AAR after the entire exercise can take one to three weeks to execute, well, to, to finalize really, depending on how big you are and how big the game was. And then you start actually implementing the changes. Now, keep in mind that while you're implementing those changes, you can be also preparing for the next one, which is what our, our top clients are doing. Let me ask so, something here that Jerry brings out constantly when we talk to clients. We push something that we use internally. So you began integrating. We've made decisions, both business, IT, structural, personnel, using this method. Uh, we start off with a war game or a scenario, and we find out that some of our people have incredible, well, all our team does, they have incredible input. So we, we use what we sell, which is... Uh, is a rare. It, absolutely. We do it ourselves. So, so, you know, just summing up, you can do this. It is possible to do this six to eight times a year and the best cybersecurity organizations do it. Now, as Don was saying, um, you know, we use this ourselves and this brings us to the selection criteria for your facilitators. Uh, basically you have pretty much two options when you're doing cyber war gaming, you can come up with the games and scenarios on your own, or you can go to a third party. If you're going to do them on your own, God bless. Call us if you have any questions. We'll let you know uh, how, how to improve it. If you are looking for third parties, this is what you should be looking at. Uh, first and foremost, and everyone always asks for this, what is your cybersecurity expertise? That's kind of table stakes. But you also should note that it's not just cybersecurity. It's technical and operational cybersecurity, as well as management and strategic cybersecurity expertise. So it doesn't help if the people running your game are low-level systems engineers who understand absolutely everything about particular attacks, but haven't really thought about things like regulatory and legal implications of decisions. Second uh, criterion is the process for staying current with a threat environment. Whoever it is that you're looking to should have a, an internal process that allows them to keep current with the real-time threat environments by monitoring threat intelligence sources, things like MITRE ATT&CK, et cetera. So far, so good. Wargaming expertise, and this is what Don was getting at just a second ago, is it really helps to work with someone who has developed war games before. And this most IT departments and most cybersecurity departments tend to lack. Not all of them, because you'd be surprised how popular wargaming is and how often your team may actually have expertise there. But one of the reasons that we at Nemertes brought Don into our team is because he brings unparalleled expertise in developing this kind of war game. Not too many people in the world have this expertise. He's a military historian. Uh, and having that on our side helps us deliver a better experience for our clients. Um, you also want someone who has what we call full spectrum stakeholder awareness. In other words, you want an organization that can understand the perspective of HR, finance, legal, as well as you know senior folks, as well as junior folks. 
that's incredibly important. And again, somebody who's narrowly focused on cybersecurity technical capabilities may not have that. It does help if they're familiar with your industry and the specific business challenges. And ideally, you want someone with whom you can have a long-term commitment so that, number one, they stay with you to maintain accountability. Did you really do what you said you were going to do? And number two, to help you develop war games that are progressive in, you know, cyber war games that are progressive so that they that you're moving forward as we've talked about. So these are all great things to look for in your in your facilitators. Strangely enough, Numerides checks all those boxes, but you knew we would, right? So with that, Jerry, over to you for the next steps. Yeah, so the first thing I want to let you know is <clears throat> you all have access to some attachments here. If you look at the little paper clip that should be sort of midway on the right part of your slide here, you can click that, and there are several links that we have here for you. So if you want to talk to me, John, or Don, we have uh, links there that you can um, you can uh, connect with us on, on, on LinkedIn, or uh, there's also another link there that you can join the Numeritis community. If you want to talk to and interact with people of similar interests, you can do that. Uh, in addition, there is a link to a Numeritis white paper uh, on this topic on uh, if you want to improve your cybersecurity, uh, you have that white paper there. And finally, uh, there's a link there that you can register for the next webinar that we have coming up. So that is the Bringing Adaptive Leadership to IT the Case for Agility. It's on April 12th at 1230 Eastern. And there is that link there in the attachments that you can register for right now. If you want to see things that we've already done, you can watch right now, uh, Mastering the Metaverse, the Framework, and Cutting uh, the Cord, Wireless All the Time. Uh, you can look at these. Also, if you go to Bright Talk, there's a number of other uh, seminars uh, and talks that we've done as well. And as Jerry mentioned, I'll just uh, uh, highlight again, uh, please do try to join our Nemertis community. We would love to have you. Uh, we all hang out there and comment. Oftentimes when we have news or, or, or alerts for our clients, they show up in our community first. So please do come and join us. And with that, I think we are at a wrap. Gentlemen, thank you very much for this. And uh, audience, thank you for coming and watching this. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very Appreciate much. It.